All right, you guys are ready? So, we are in the middle of the uh, um, talking about climate change. And um, even before the uh, human perturbation, especially on greenhouse gases, so uh, there was climate change, right? So natural variation of the climate has been there. So um, in this class, for only uh, three classes, we are talking about um, the possibility on um, a human influence on natural or climate system. So that's something that we are worrying about right now. We call it global warming. And then it is pretty obvious if you take a look at the, all the temperature observation data and then temperature proxy, it's very obvious that less than about 200 years happened to be that uh, human uh, started emitting a lot of CO2 to the atmosphere. Uh, has been uh, most warmest years past about 1,000 years. And then uh, it's kind of a, a big discussion whether human has capability to perturb climate system. So uh, to understand that uh, theory, what effect depends on the, uh, how you believe, uh, you should understand the uh, uh, climate system. So climate system is basically how much we are getting from the sun, right? Uh, that's the energy Earth can emit. And then uh, Earth is emitting currently about 290 Kelvin, which is about 25 degrees Celsius, right? Mm. No, actually 15. After 15 degrees Celsius in average. And um, so this is the gases that interacts with IR wavelength region that, that um, Earth is emitting, right? So uh, mostly, um, uh, wavelength region uh, longer than 15 micrometer and then below than 6 micrometer and then these are wavelength region that Earth is, em is emitting which is IR. I think one of the coolest questions is about that. And then um, in natural condition when CO2 gets about 280 ppm then uh, about the 80% uh, of this wavelength region which happened to be the peak uh, Earth uh, wavelength re region that Earth is emitting, we call it atmosphere window. It's kind of filtered by N uh, CO2, N2O, methane, and ozone. So if these gases concentration is getting increased, then uh, more of this Earth's radiation is going to be trapped in the atmosphere, right? And then that's going to be warming up the, uh, uh, the Earth's surface. So in terms of uh, 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 greenhouse gases concentration variation. So as you can see from 1750, so concentration has been shoot it up like methane and then 2O. So we discussed about CO2 and then ocean acidification, things like that, right? And then that's the one uh, harmful way to uh, CO2 affects on the, uh, um, the ocean uh, ecosystem. But even bigger problem of CO2 is that by blocking this atmosphere window, Previously, that amount of the energy, this, the energy that Earth is emitting is directly uh, coming out to the space so that wouldn't make any greenhouse effect on the uh, Earth. But if the CO2 concentration getting bigger and bigger and bigger, more heat that Earth is emitting is going to be trapped by the atmosphere and it's going to be emitted to the surface. Okay? So that's the, uh, um, the roles of the greenhouse gases, right? So this is what uh, science can tell you about with our best knowledge uh, about uh, different kind of uh, atmospheric constituents uh, affecting on climate system. So top three, actually four, are greenhouse gases. So CO2, methane, and N2O, and hollow And then hollow uh, stopped, uh, we stopped making this hollow carbons because we thought this is the, uh, um, actually we know that this is uh, destroying the stratospheric ozone, so that's going to be going away. So we are worrying about mostly CO2 and methane and N2O. And then we talked about the interaction between IR and this molecule, which is a uh, uh, vibrational transition. So um, we, uh, science clearly uh, uh, can show you that CO2 is warming up 
So basically, this is CO2 that emitted by human between 1950 to 2005 uh, warmed up the, uh, over the years this much. So about 1.5 watts per square meter, and then we call it radiative forcing. Then other greenhouse gases also has positive radiative forcing, which means that warming up the Earth's surface, okay? And a stratosphere of ozone, uh, actually cooling down the atmosphere, uh, uh, cooling down the uh, Earth's surface because it is blocking the UV radiation from the sun. And then tropospheric ozone actually act as the uh, uh, greenhouse gases again. But um, as you can see, currently science has very big uncertainty in predicting exact amount of the cooling impacts over the Earth's surface because, you know, obviously our, uh, aerosol is gonna blocking the solar radiation, but the, uh, the interaction between um, uh, aerosol and solar radiation is quite complicated. So we think in general, it's gonna be cooling down the uh, atmosphere, but as you can see, the arrow bar in here, there's a very large arrow bar associated with the uh, uh, aerosol cooling impact on the, um, over the uh, climate, Earth's climate system. And then we briefly talked about, uh, especially for the uh, non-scientific uh, group, actually talked about sun, so basically solar activity. If sun emits less energy, then obviously our Earth is gonna be getting cooling off, right? So uh, people claim that uh, maybe sun is the reason, not human is the reason. But if, you, if we take a look at the old observation data, and then this is our best assessment, that uh, the solar radiation changed between 1750 to 2005. So basically this is very tiny um, fraction of the uh, uh, contribution towards the uh, global warming, as you can see here. And then uh, in if you take a look at the arrow bar right here, uh, we, have pretty, we have very good understanding on solar activity uh, past about 200 years. So we don't think at this time point, this is out of the table, okay? So why the aerosol is so complicated and then what caused that big aerosol? So we talked about this thing when we discussed about uh, uh, aerosol particle in the atmosphere. So if uh, atmosphere particle is white like cloud, so a lot of uh, uh, actually a solar radiation is gonna be reflected away. But this suit of black carbon, so because it's black, which means that all the visible wavelengths is gonna be absorbed by this particle. And then it's gonna, because it is, this is black body, it's gonna be, uh, radiate the energy, um, the amount of energy that it is getting from the solar radiation. And then because atmospheric uh, temperature is IR region, so it's gonna be emitting IR, which is the sensible heat. So this is gonna be heating up the atmosphere. So um, because we don't know exactly how much suits are out there and the white particles out there that can reflect the, uh, um, um, solar radiation. Also, we don't understand quite well in terms of their cloud formation, things like that. So there are a lot of uncertainties. So I will, so I will introduce just one uncertain factor on the uh, uh, aerosol. So, so obviously, if you just summarize all the things that I showed you past two classes, although uh, you know, climate science is a very big discipline, it takes a lot of time to understand what's going on, and then there's a lot of researchers that are doing their best you know, job in terms of predicting future, understanding the uh, climate system. But you know, based on their past one and a half lectures, we learned this far, I guess, right? So, um, so global warming cause higher than average temperature, obviously surface is gonna be heating up. And then uh, one of the biggest concerns that we have right now the Arctic region actually uh, warmed up much faster than the other part of the Earth. So there's a lot of loss of ice, especially over the Arctic, that may raise the uh, um, um, sea level, obviously. And then there's a lot of another big concerns about this ice melting that we'll, we'll discuss about uh, today. And then uh, extreme temperature, or, or obviously the global warming, we think that there's more possibility in terms of the uh, uh, um, uh, extreme uh, weather events, and then that's also we, something we are gonna talk about. 
obviously those kind of extreme uh, weather events is going to affect on the uh, crop yield, things like that. So or basically uh, directly related with your food source. And then uh, also affect on the, your health and then ocean acidification, things like that. So we'll just discuss about it you know, briefly uh, today. So first one is the ice loss and then associated uh, sea, sea level rise. So this is the, uh, so from 1979 was the first year that we have a capability to monitor the sea, uh, sea ice over the Arctic. So since then, the Arctic has been, uh, ha has lost its uh, uh, sea ice uh, uh, since 1979 till very recently. And then this is Antarctic sea ice. But Antarctic sea ice is not really quite obvious. If you take a look at that, the data is very widely fluctuating. Even you can uh, draw with some slight increase of the sea ice extent. But because we are losing so much of ice in Arctic region, so um, we currently don't have good understanding why um, this thing is happening in Antarctic. But simply, we are losing too much ice in Arctic. So that's our current understanding. So uh, this is obvious, you know, consequences. You know, kind of a, a cute a little polar bear. But this is not really cute little polar bear. Once you face this guy in the Arctic region, you're pretty much dead body, all right? <laughs> but, uh, but obviously, you know, that's there instinct, so there's nothing we can do about it. But uh, obviously they lost their, you know, uh, habitats. That's the obvious region. And then you can see a lot of these photos here and there. And then what's the, what's the real concerns about their sea ice loss is that rising the uh, uh, sea level. So this is the best knowledge we have so far in terms of the uh, uh, sea le level. So um, from 1860 to about 2000, has been rise about uh, 100 millimeter, which is 10 centimeter. So about this far, right? But you may think that this far, 10 centimeter, may not be a big deal. And then this is uh, uh, current. Uh, so this is actual observation that I showed you. So it has been increased about uh, 10 millimeter, something like that. Actually, based on this photo, this based on this uh, graph is 200 millimeter to zero, so uh, that's about 20 centimeter. So this far, about this far, 200 millimeter is about this side. So uh, uh, we think that it may um, rise until 2100, maybe go up to about 50 centimeter, which is about 50 centimeter, maybe more than that, maybe this far. So you may think that's not much, but this kind of a, you know, exotic island is going to be completely gone if she, sea level rise is happening as expected. This, this beautiful island, you may think about the beautiful line, island only, but a, a lot of uh, our uh, big cities actually nearby the uh, ocean side, right? I think I read that thing a couple of years ago in National Geographic. In the U.S., half of the population actually living in the county that uh, faced uh, in the uh, um, uh, ocean side. So uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, actually is going to be an even bigger problem in Miami. Um, it sounds like if the sea level rise is going on as predicted in the, in the higher end, then Miami uh, downtown is going to be completely gone in the year 2100. So that's the projection. So actually, uh, even before human perturbation, uh, natural uh, climate uh, change actually uh, change that uh, uh, the coastline drama dramatically. So that was uh, we uh, current, our current knowledge about I think well, when is this thing before about uh, sixteen hundred thousand years before uh, BC, the coastline over the Europe was just looks like this. So UK was not really island at the time. But so uh, the uh, Norway is under the uh, iceberg, and then you can see the iceberg all around here and there. So that's about 16,000 years BC. And then the temperature difference uh, in uh, global average between this configuration and this configuration that we have is about 10 degrees Celsius. So with our best knowledge, uh, predict, uh, climate model actually predicts if we are doing uh, business as usual, then um, the temperature, average global average temperature, um, then um, in uh, year 2100, it's going to be about four, degree, four to six degrees Celsius higher than what you have right now. 
So uh, it's now it's on your imagination what's going to be happening if that uh, prediction is right. And then that's kind of a big scale thing because this is a, a, a air pollution class. There's some other implication about rising temperature over the air pollution. So, uh, so this question that we had so far is that how that human pollution affect on the uh, climate change. But let's talk about how the climate change, the uh, rising temperature, can affect on the uh, uh, ongoing uh, air pollution problem. So this is one example, uh, which is uh, uh, ozone um, production. So uh, tropospheric uh, ozone production for photochemical ozone, LA type smog, whatever you call it. So uh, let's review uh, that thing again, because uh, final is coming. So it's a good time to uh, review these things, right? So everything starts from NOx, right? And uh, to NO plus so. So that's for 20 nanometer wavelengths. And then this is visible wavelengths, right? And ozone. And then ozone. NO. NO2. Plus NO2. So NO2 can go back and then produce, keep producing ozone, and then losing ozone. So it's kind of a balance. And then the balance uh, is about 40 to, uh, 20 to 40 ppb. So that's natural concentration of ozone. But if you have some VOCs and CO, right, then uh, that can produce. VOC and CO that can produce RO2, peroxide radical, or HO2. So these guys has excess oxygen there that can make NO to NO2. So if you compare this to reaction that is making NO2 right here. So basically the reaction number one, which is usually going on in the clean environment, you are, you are basically destroying ozone, right? So you are making ozone from here, then you are destroying ozone. So if this cycle going on, then our system is got balanced. So there, there's not going to be a much higher ozone concentration out there. So there will be no ozone uh, pollution episode uh, if these uh, pathways are dominant. But if you have too much VOCs and CO, they can uh, make the uh, excess amount of NO2 from this radical without destroying ozone right here, then uh, you will start to build up ozone because this reaction is not going to be happening. So that's basically uh, the synopsis of the uh, uh, ozone pollution, right? So let's assume that uh, there's uh, uh, CO2. Obviously, a lot of CO2 is making in the city center, right? because a lot of cars is burning uh, fossil fuel, things like that. So there will be a lot of uh, CO2 emission in the city. And then uh, because it is greenhouse gases, so it's going to be uh, increasing the surface temperature over the city because of CO2. Then the issue is this reaction here, and then this reaction, then VOC and CO making this radical, it's going to be much faster. Okay because temp of temperature increase. That means that higher temperature in polluted environment will produce more ozone. So basically, the conclusion is higher temperature, faster reaction, so higher ozone. That makes sense, right? So basically, uh, this is what it looks like. So basically, when um, temperature gets high, you have higher water mixing ratio. This, that's precursor for the, uh, this thing. And then uh, the higher temperature will make the uh, more ozone. And then in polluted environment, this is only one Kelvin di uh, difference, which is one degree Celsius. That's about uh, one degree Celsius is the, about half Fahrenheit. So there's tiny difference in terms of temperature. But if you take a look at here, 
that even in given water vapor mixing ratio, that ozone actually is a little higher than the lower temperature, okay? If you take a look at here, right? So ozone is decreased this much. So you may, you may think that this is not much of the ozone increase, like 10 ppb or something, but you gotta tie into public health issue now. So this is the model. So realistic model, this is Los Angeles phasing. Basically, all CO2 is mostly emitted from the city center right here. So CO2 gets much, much higher right there due to uh, human emission. And then, uh, so this is uh, eight hour ozone death, basically uh, based on the uh, calculation of the ozone concentration. And then this is the number of the uh, increase of the human death per eight hour due to this increased ozone. So as you can see, mostly the death is located, number of death increased due to uh, excess amount of ozone that produced by the higher temperature located in suburb, suburban region because that um, we talked, discussed about uh, this thing, the ozone is making outside of the city center in suburb region mostly. So a higher ozone concentration usually observed not directly in the city center, more like suburban region, if it happened to be more people living in there. So um, uh, suburban region, so uh, that's, it, this is just eight hours, so 0.2 uh, more, more deaths, that's actually deaths per year. So may seem not that much, but you know, if you just integrate whole region, this can be something, right? So, and then additional uh, the aerosol production actually cause more fatality, fatality due to uh, this one Fahrenheit increase, actually, yeah, one Fahrenheit, actually two Fahrenheit increase uh, uh, over the uh, city center. So that's the model result. So uh, if you take a look at the average in California, so we, so this model estimation indicate that uh, the uh, warming, excessive warming, warming in the city center from this excess amount of CO2 can cause more death if uh, just in the California 5,200 people per year uh, due to respiratory illness and the cardiovascular disease and the severe asthma, things like that. So if we just extend this um, model to the uh, whole uh, United States, mostly uh, CO2 increase uh, over the uh, city. So uh, it's uh, near around the, this uh, north eastern part of the country, and then Bay, uh, the California, and then some part of the uh, south, southeast, and then Texas area. And then this is the number of the people, uh, uh, more deaths due to this additional ozone, and then PM due to, just due to the CO2 increase over the city. And then that warms up the, uh, uh, the specific region due to uh, 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 greenhouse effect, and then uh, that, uh, increased temperature expediting this ozone production and then um, particle production, and then that can cause this public health problem in even very local time scale. So previous example about the polar bear kind of thing, is sea level rise, it's global thing you can think of, but even in the very regional city or your uh, neighborhood kind of a regional scale, you can uh, clearly, uh, we should clearly feel this kind of differences that caused by uh, this warming, okay? That's the um, main event. So the question is, we just, because we need to predict the future, right? About what's going on for decision making, things like that. And then uh, we are pretty much rely on the model. Then uh, your question should be, how good is the model? So this is kind of a performance task for uh, but, uh, 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 13 different model. So GCM means the, the global climate models. So uh, basically we can use the uh, previous observation between 1900 to 2000, right? So this black line right here, black thick uh, solid line is the actual observation. And then this is multiple different, uh, different color line is the, uh, uh, the result from a global climate model, 13 different climate model. As you can see, the climate model uh, can um, simulate and then um, very reasonably with, it, uh, with our actual observation. So that's, this is the one thing, 
right? And then you may ask that whether this increase is not really human caused or, or natural. Uh, it can be a natural thing, you can ask that way. But uh, because this is a, a numeric model, what you can do is that you can turn off the uh, natural, uh, you can turn off the uh, uh, human CO2 emission, and then you can learn the model again so that what's the natural variation of temperature like uh, in terms of the model prediction. So that's the uh, one model predicts right here. So this is all different model, the uh, thin line, and then this is the, uh, the average of that 30 model. So uh, in the model, if you turn off the human activity, then clearly the model indicate that uh, temperature should not uh, be a reason that uh, higher as we observed. And then basically the difference here between the, uh, this model without human activity and then observation. So this is the, uh, what human caused so far. So, the, so basically this kind of uh, um, exercise give us some uh, confidence in our modeling capability. But although we are doing a relatively good job, but also uh, there should be, there, I should stress on that there's a lot of uncertainty associated with the uh, aerosol and things like that at this time point. So um, because now we got some confidence based, based on the uh, past data set, what you can do is the uh, future prediction, right? So uh, this is the uh, future prediction that best we got. So we are around 2013, so right here. So this is a CO2 concentration. Right now we are about 400 ppm in global uh, average. And then uh, climate science, science, science people actually come up with many different scenarios, right? So if we are doing, we are emitting CO2 as, uh, as we are, as, so we, what uh, people call business as usual, if we are emitting CO2 just as much as uh, we are right now, and then you can just factor in the uh, economic uh, development of the developing country like China and India, then uh, CO2 concentration is gonna be shooting up uh, if you are doing uh, just to business as usual, and then we are expecting uh, in year 2100, the CO2 concentration is gonna be 1,000 ppm, based, uh, basically uh, as twice as much as what we have right now in the atmosphere. But if we, so the other extreme case is that if we can control the CO2 emission from right now, they're replacing all the CO2 emitter with the uh, renewable sources, things like that, then, then ideal scenario that we can have is that we can just set the CO2 concentration about 400 ppm or 500 ppm. So these are what um, climate model tells us that uh, what's gonna be the temperature range is gonna be like between these two extreme scenario. So uh, in, in year 2100, uh, so basically, uh, uh, in the uh, 1980 uh, um, time frame, then temperature is going to be increased between about one to about six degrees Celsius, which is about 10 Fahrenheit, about that range. So this is another kind of projection. So this is relatively short term. So this is uh, uh, from 2100, and then this is actually uh, 20, 20, 20 2025, right? So, um, so global scientists are actually doing this exercise since 1990. Uh, that's why we set the uh, kind of baseline as uh, 1990. So first IPCC, International Panel for Climate Change. I think that's the, that's the right acronym. Um, our first report was uh, coming out in 1990. So at the time, people uh, did uh, some uh, different model scenario. So if we are doing business as usual, and if we are doing some aggressive uh, CO2 cutting off, things like that. So at the time, the projection was like this. So in 1990, in 2010, in 10 years, CO2 uh, emission is gonna be like this. If we are doing business as usual, CO2 is, emission is like that. If we are doing very aggressive uh, a policy that can cut off the uh, CO2. But we ended up emitting the worst scenario in terms of uh, CO2 emission. And then, um, so basically, uh, the temperature increase has been more like a higher range. So in uh, year, year 2025, then if you are doing uh, business as usual, the temperature increase in just 25 year, five years uh, from 1990. Uh, so 35 years is gonna be about one degree Celsius. 
So um, this is kind of the same thing. So you may think that this is nothing, but last time when we have CO2 above 5 pp 500 ppm, that's about 55 million years ago, 55 to 36 million years ago. Uh, so at that time, actually, the temperature was about uh, so that so right now CO2 concentration is 400 ppm, and then the model indicate that uh, if we are doing as business as usual, then uh, uh, CO2 concentration gets higher than 1,000 ppm. So in natural condition, when CO2 gets above 500 ppm, which was about uh, 50 million years ago, so there was a palm tree, basically. Uh, the fossil, indica uh, fossil record indicate that there was palm tree in Wyoming. Basically, there's no ice over the Arctic and Antarctic. Arctic was in crocodile. Uh, crocodiles lived in the Arctic region, and then Antarctic was a pine forest, things like that. So basically, human is doing uh, very, I don't know, I should, how should I call it? But uh, it's very scary experiment right now, what's going to be happening um, next 100 years if we are emitting CO2 as usual. So. Um, so a lot of, a lot of uh, people, or government, or politician, or you, even you guys, doing some grassroots movement, things like that, try to cut off the CO2 emission in this region, right? And uh, this is uh, um, 2007 global CO2 emission um, data. So now the biggest chunk is the China, 21%, and US is 90%. And then India is about 5.3, and then you can just take a look at the older um, data. And then uh, basically, this is basically following up uh, um, how much industrialized each country becomes. So if you just turn on uh, the news, then um, some people actually complain about you know, why the US should do something. Obviously, uh, China emitting more CO2. Then uh, if we do, do something, it's, there, it's not going to be any consequences. But if you divide it, uh, number of CO2 emission by people, number of population, still US is the number one by big margin compared with the China. And then uh, um, Canada is another big country, big emitter. If you divide by the uh, CO2 emission by number of people uh, in each country, and then interestingly, Saudi Arabia is really, really big emitter. You know, which, which is understandable. They have a lot of uh, uh, oil there, and then uh, you know people probably drive a lot. It's very hot out there, and then people probably um, using air conditioning a lot. You know, it's hot out there. Australia is about on, on another big country. So although um, uh, it is in uh, kind of a, a developed country, Japan, Germany, and then other European countries, uh, um, per capita CO2 emission is relatively lower compared with the uh, US, Canada, and Saudi Arabia, and uh, Australia. Probably that's related with their uh, lifestyle, right? People out in the Europe just using a lot of uh, public transportation, things like that. So their uh, carbon footprint is relatively small. But it's very difficult. I should acknowledge that it's very difficult to change the, uh, um, the lifestyle. So I uh, have lived in this country past 10 years. And then you know I'm driving the car wherever I go, things like that. And then whenever I just travel back to my country, Korea, and then out there, people just mostly using public transportation. Actually, that bothered me. Actually, I just hate to using the transport, public transportation out there. So once your lifetime has changed to a more comfortable life, it's very difficult to go back to uh, you know, less comfortable life, I, I should say. So anyway, that's your judgment call. So that's basically data that we have currently. And then uh, in 1990, so uh, at that time, uh, after the Montreal Protocol, so that was kind of a good example. So we got to do something globally to curb CO2 emission. So at the time, um, the government representative agrees that cutting off the CO2 emission in developed country, like uh, Switzerland and US and Canada, buy a lot right here. And then you know, give some slack to a uh, uh, developing country, and then the country are not emitting that much of CO2. There's some uh, you know, political and di diplomatic background depends on the quota that each country has. And then uh, a lot of country has agreed this protocol. And then um, I think most of the country ratified, basically, uh, once a representative of each country agrees on something, then their Congress should pass that uh, protocol to make that thing effective. 
But uh, you know, I don't know. It's just, this, we should this thing as fortunately or unfortunately. But uh, we haven't. The fact is that U.S. has not ratified uh, Kyoto Protocol yet. So um, there's a big controversy going on. And then uh, this is your judgment call. That's a good thing or bad thing. So that's the, I'm just explaining the fact that this class. But uh, if you take a look at the uh, data, CO2 emission data past couple of years, actually, even without government enforcement, CO2 emission has been decreased in the US. Actually, this is the data. Probably this is not fair data because uh, this is data from uh, 2007 to 2008. So you remember what was going on in 2007 economically? There was a big um, recession going on. So, so basically, this is the, uh, each country. So this red uh, part is the Northern America. And then this is South America region, this color. And then this is Europe. And this is Asia, right? Because U.S. was suffering an uh, economic recession, uh, the U.S. just one year, there was a 7% decrease in CO2 emission in 2007 to 2008. And then uh, overall, U.S. is number two uh, country in terms of CO2 emission. But still, uh, China uh, has uh, been increased in terms of CO2 emission a lot, about 13% just one year. So um, if you can take a look at the, some other country, Germany is 7% decrease, UK is about 8% decrease. It's cons kind of consistent that most of the developed country uh, emission of CO2 uh, quite a bit um, in 2007 to 2008 timeframe. So I explained this thing before. So, and then uh, I, I emailed you this um, PDF file for um, your um, reading assignment this week. And then this is basically uh, summarizing 10 questions that uh, a lot of people are asking about climate science. So you, if you just read it through, and then if you can answer that question, and then if you just uh, ask yourself if you could uh, answer uh, that que each question, each 10 questions out there, then you will have no problem to uh, uh, take the uh, final exam, especially uh, just specifically on the uh, climate change topic, OK? So this is, again, I should uh, stress that this is uh, um, um, IPCC report that was published in 2007. Actually, IPCC and um, Al Gore got the Nobel Peace Prize for contribution uh, for this. And then uh, there's new new uh, IPCC report just published. I think few months, th last month even. So last month, but you know, I'm kind of getting lazy. I haven't looked up that yet. So I'm just sticking with the uh, past version of the IPCC report. So um, we discussed this thing a lot, right? So uh, what factors determine the Earth's climate is that energy from the sun, energy coming out from the Earth, and then some part of that uh, energy is trapped in the atmosphere by greenhouse gases, and then that's reflecting back to the Earth's surface. So that's the warming up the Earth's surface, and then we call it uh, greenhouse effect, right? And then uh, uh, one thing that oh, that's on your homework question also, so basically, the fraction that was not observed by the Earth's surface reflected away. So reflection portion, we call it albedo, right? That's the uh, definition of albedo. And then uh, a lot of people confused by, again, that uh, climate and then weather. So uh, we uh, discussed about that basically climate is the uh, kind of a statistics of the day-by-day uh, uh, -day weather. So um, you can read it through uh, this PDF file. but. Um, Basically, some people kind of attack that, you know, so obviously the weather forecast cannot predict next week's weather. Then why should we believe in uh, climate scientists' model result, which is 100 years away, right? That's kind of a, a question you can raise if you are skeptics. But uh, this is a completely different thing. It's basically, climate science is about statistics. So in average, temperature is going to be raised this much. But so basically, uh, if, you, if you take one analogy, is that you know I might just you know getting killed by car accident, things like that after this class, while I just walk away to my home, things like that, right? That may happen. But I'm just preparing my life, just like I will just you know every lifespan is going to be about 75 or 80 years. That's what statistics are talking about. So I've saved some money for my retirement, things like that. Why people are doing that? Although uh, you never know when you are going to die, because we have some statistics that 
uh, talking about, so people are usually living this much of life, so people preparing their, um, so people adjust their uh, lifestyle based on the statistics, right? So climate is more like statistics, and then day-to-day day -day variation is more like weather. But um, obviously there are some um, uh, correlation between climate and weather, uh, because in average, as you can see here, uh, climate, uh, actually the temperature, global average temperature has been increased past a uh, couple of decades. So we are seeing more and more record hot weather these days. Statistics obviously uh, uh, indicate that. And then uh, we, uh, we are uh, getting less and less cold weather, like cold, cold weather past a uh, 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 couple hundred years, right? So that's the, uh, what climate uh, is dictating. And then uh, uh, because of this uh, uh, average temperature increase, we are thinking that we are seeing more intense um, hurricanes, and then we are seeing more intense drought, things like that. But again, it is very uh, difficult to tie that one um, very severe uh, weather event, like a, hurricane, a typhoon in Philippines and the uh, superstorm Sandy, things like that. Uh, we cannot really blame just one event, whether that is caused by um, climate change, global warming, or that's kind of a natural uh, deviation. Because um, so uh, weather and climate is two different things, and then two different approach, right? But statistically, we think that we are having more uh, severe weather event down the road in the future. Okay. So uh, what's the greenhouse effect? So greenhouse gases. Once greenhouse gases getting into the uh, atmosphere, and then that's reflecting back the heat that Earth is emitting that warms up the Earth's surface again. That's the greenhouse effect. And then um, this is the uh, about 2,000 years data of CO2, methane, and NO2 increase. And then we are thinking this CO2, methane, and uh, NO2, actually N2, not NO2. NO2 increase actually caused the uh, uh, in average warming. But as you can see, there's a big error bar there and then that is caused by the rolls of aerosol. So we, if you are not familiar with this concept, you can just read through it. And then uh, this is again, this basically plot indicate that in average, we think the precipitation is gonna be decreased most of the world. So the red means that we are gonna have less precipitation due to climate change uh, in the future. And then blue means there will be more precipitation due to climate change. But one thing you, you gotta know is that uh, the uh, distribution is not even. So some part of the world uh, gets a severe drought. It seems like the in average gets a severe drought uh, due to climate change. But obviously some part of the world is kinda getting more rain, right? So uh, again, this kind of a, a one, if I need to make the one statement in terms of if you, somebody asks about the, uh, how is the precipitation changing due to climate change, probably, Anybody should say that uh, the, um, there is going to be more drought out there in the future, but uh, that's the average of the whole globe. So some part of the world, actually, the precipitation is going to be increasing, but uh, in um, uh, average, that uh, precipitation uh, looks like it's going to be decreased quite a bit um, due to uh, climate change. So again, the other thing, extreme weather event like waves, drought, and floods, hurricanes, so we think heat waves, we think this is, is gonna be increasing due to climate change, but there's one weather event we really cannot tie in between um, global uh, warming and um, weather event, extreme weather event is actually, um, what is that thing? Tornado. So uh, we don't have good explanation whether uh, number of tornado is gonna be increased next, uh, in the future due to climate change or not. But uh, we uh, have, at least in the model, have a good tie in between heat wave, drought, flood, and hurricane. And the number of events is gonna be increased also, if, especially for the hurricanes, that the strength of, of that hurric each hurricane event is gonna be increased due to uh, uh, temperature increase, especially over the ocean. So we talked about this thing, that if you take a look at the temperature increase, so this is uh, uh, Northern Hemisphere, especially the polar region, so uh, the temperature increase is much faster than the uh, southern hemisphere. So right here, temperature increase in uh, Antarctic is not as much high as the uh, uh, northern hemisphere. So uh, ice loads 
over the northern hemisphere is much, much faster. Okay, that's another thing you should know. So again, this is the third time I showed you uh, this chart, this uh, graph. So, which means that this is very important, okay? Okay, so, um, so basically we have, we have very clear understanding. I will just explain a little different view, uh, perspective uh, at this time, okay? Although this is third time. So we have a pretty good understanding in greenhouse gases like CO2, methane, and hydrocarbons are warming up the atmosphere. And uh, if we uh, translate that thing into this plot, so this is radioactive forcing, so that's zero, right? So one, two, three, four, this is warming side, and then this is minus one, minus two, and minus three, that is cooling down side, okay? So we have pretty good understanding on how much this uh, CO2, methane, and hydrocarbon is gonna increase the temperature. So that's our best guess how much those uh, greenhouse gases is gonna heating up the Earth's surface. So as you can see, it's pretty tight curve, as you can see here. And then we think that aerosol is gonna be cooling down the atmosphere, right, out here. But it has pretty big aerobar, right? So if we translate those two bars associated with the aerosol here, then oh, we have this curve right here. But if you compare the shape of the curve, the warming curve and cooling curve, warming curve, sorry. So warming curve, uh, because of the, uh, um, due to uh, um, greenhouse gases, and then cooling curve, because of the uh, uh, aerosol, it is much wider, which uh, indicate that we have uh, big aerobars in terms of the aerosol. So um, if you add two things up, so in average, we are pretty sure that all these factors that human make are warming up the atmosphere because it is plus side. But if you add it up this uncertainty, there are tiny, tiny fraction of possibility that Earth is actually cooling down. So that's about what math tells us, right? So in statistic world, this is 90% of confidence interval. So in terms of 90% of confidence interval, that we are pretty sure human actually warming up the atmosphere or, or Earth, right? So this much sure. So this is probably less than 1%. There's obviously some chance that Actually, if you're adding up this whole thing, that we are cooling down the atmosphere. So um, basically, there's a global warming going on. So uh, probably 99% sure that's human caused, but there's tiny fraction in statistical reason that um, there's something uh, going, uh, so you can say that maybe we are cooling down the earth, but that's very tiny fraction of the uh, probability. So uh, some people trying to use these statistics that we gotta do nothing. So this is again the judgment call. Then um, there are, I think there are three kind of people out there in the world in terms of climate discussion. Then one people basically think that you know climate change is real. Let's say a climate change is real or global warming is real. And then that's caused by the human. So we gotta do something. That's one kind of people. The second kind of people is that, um, yeah, global warming is a fact, but if you can take a look at this, oh, come on. Uh, if you take a look at this, then actually there are small, small chance actually we are cooling down the, the uh, uh, earth. Actually the warming thing is caused by the uh, natural uh, variation. So we gotta do nothing. That's another part. Uh, way of thinking. And some people even just deny that, no, global warming is not a fact, right? So some people claim that way. So um, it depends, so how do you uh, define, depends on how do you define skeptics. But uh, global warming is pretty much a real thing if you take a look at all the temperature data. You know, obviously temperature has been increased. And then uh, overwhelming um, kind of possibility 
if you take a look at uh, statistical analysis, um, it's very likely caused by the human impact, although there's a big uncertainty in aerosol. There's something that scientists should do, address about this thing. So uh, what government is doing these days, what uh, people are doing these days, uh, cutting off the CO2 emission. So um, from now, this is judgment call by you that um, which side you want to be on. So I just try to explain the scientific fact at this time point. So let's talk a little bit about how uh, we got to deal with this problem. There's uh, many different ways you can deal with it. So that's one I interview that Al Gore had a couple of years ago with Katie Curick. So let's listen to uh, this interview. The Wall Street Journal reported in June that someone named Joanne Simpson, the first woman to receive a PhD in meteorology, doubts humans cause climate change. And a Japanese physicist who contributed to the UN climate change report calls the theory of global warming the worst scientific scandal in history. Now these sound like pretty reputable individuals to me, and you're signing, so apparently you don't think they are? She's a it was sort of more of a little expression of disgust at what this may. Incredulity. Uh, the United Nations uh, organized along with the scientific bodies, uh, uh, National Academies of Science and their counterparts, uh, the 3,000 best scientists in the world uh, from all of the fields that are relevant to this issue. And over the last 20 years, they have conducted the most exhaustive examination ever of a, a challenge like this. They've issued four reports. They've all been unanimous. And the last one called the evidence unequivocal. Now, does that mean that there are still some people who are going to have a contrarian view? No, of, of course. Uh, that, that there will still be some. But uh, there are still some people who believe that the moon landing was staged on a, on a movie lot, a, you know, a significant percentage, as it turns out, or that the Earth is flat. But that doesn't lead uh, public policymakers to say, oh, well, we should take both sides of, of that into account. In fact, the consensus on the science uh, of global warming is as settled as it ever gets in science. So this is one way to look at it. And I, I think I assigned this thing as a reading assignment also. So one really difficult uh, part in terms of the climate prediction is actually um, uh, roles of cloud, specifically cloud in the aerosol world. So we talked about this thing. If you have more aerosol particle, basically you will have more cloud droplet. That means that you have a smaller size of the cloud so there will be less precipitation. So that will be cooling down over the earth. We talked about this thing. The pollution cause uh, um, less precipitation, right? We talked about this thing. And then uh, another uh, big uncertainty that we have is that depends on where the cloud exists. So for example, this, um, this kind of cloud, low line cloud, actually blocking the solar radiation. So basically cooling down the surface. But um, the cloud happened to be locating the very high altitude, we call it cirrus, actually um, uh, warming up the surface. Because basically, as you can see here, uh, the, this high line cloud actually transmitting the uh, visible uh, wavelengths all the way down to the surface. And then it is trapping the heat that uh, the Earth is emitting. So that's the uh, reason behind of it. So why we just care about cloud? We are in Orange County. We, you know, rarely see the cloud. But in global global sense, do you, can you guess the, how much of the fraction of the Earth is actually covered by the cloud? Thirty-five, thirty-six, 
37. Five more seconds. Okay. Oops, no, no, no. So D was the most 40%. So let's almost, maybe somebody read this article. So uh, this article, please read this article. Um, at least one question is gonna be coming out from this article in the final. So that's a pretty good explanation about current uh, state of the uh, climate change issue. And then uh, he basically uh, explained the uh, one scientist view on we gotta do nothing in climate change because basically cloud is gonna be saving us. So if you take a look at here. So this is basically one snapshot of the, uh, of the Earth by the uh, um, satellite. So about 60% of Earth actually covered by the cloud one given time. That's a lot of surface area. So which means that we gotta have really good understanding how this cloud is gonna interact with the solar radiation or Earth's um, IR radiation to uh, accurately predict the uh, future climate. But um, scientists, we um, actually, um, although I'm not cli a climate scientist, so a lot of climate scientists acknowledge the uncertainty in um, uh, constraining this uh, 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 cloud contribution towards climate change. So that's uh, another big thing that, um, that we need to constrain. So uh, please read this article about uh, this his opinion. So basically his idea about this cloud theory is that he basically acknowledged that uh, CO2 is gonna be warming up the atmosphere and then once CO2 is warming up the atmosphere, his theory is that there will be more low-lying cloud than the high cloud. So high cloud basically warming up the atmosphere, low-lying cloud and the cooling down the atmosphere. There will be less high cloud in the equator. So um, the Earth is going to be cooling down due to um, this less high-lying clouds. So that's his theory. So not many people are actually buying that idea at this time point. So I'm trying to tell you that there's a tiny fraction of the uh, um, even climate scientist world think that we gotta do nothing because cloud will save us. So, um, so there's a lot of different ideas about it. So I'm just trying to, again, to explain that sci uh, scientific findings so far. And then uh, you gotta get to decide about your own opinions. So we have 20 minutes, so I will just sh uh, play this two different story about climate scientists. First one is Judith Curry. She is a climate scientist, and then she is a chair of a School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Georgia Institute of Technology. Actually, I got, um, I went to grad school at Georgia Tech, and then she hooded me <laughs> when I got the PhD. So, and then uh, I have some, you know, so personally, I know her, so I will uh, play her opinion on climate change. And then he is the uh, climate scientist, Kevin Tremberth. So he's a senior scientist at uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. So I happen to be that institution also. I don't know, personally know him, but he was a star scientist in that NCAR. So I was in uh, atmospheric chemistry division and then he's a uh, climate science division. So I will just contrast these two scientists, uh, different views on climate change and what's, what we gotta do about it. So hopefully this can help you make your own mind about what you gotta do in climate change. So first one is from Judith Cree. Considered from NPR News, I'm Audie Clark, and I'm Alyssa Block. 
the Obama administration presses forward with plans to deal with climate change, Congress remains steadfast against taking action. It's not easy to find a scientist who agrees with that point of view, but conservatives who oppose doing something can find an ally in a bona fide climate scientist by the name of Judith Curry. And here's Richard Harris recently caught up with this controversial scientist to find out what she believes about climate change and why. Climate change is very low on the congressional agenda at the moment, but every now and then it puts in an appearance. The Committee on the Environment will come to order. Utah Republican Chris Stewart chaired a House subcommittee meeting this spring to talk about climate policy. Our first witness is Dr. Judith Curry, Professor and Chair of the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Georgia Institute of Technology and President of the Climate Forecast Applications Network. That's a forecasting consultancy she runs on the side of her academic day job. She's one of a very small pool of atmospheric scientists that a Republican would invite to talk about climate change. It's not that she denies global warming is happening. If all other things remain equal, it's clear that adding more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere will warm the planet. But she went on, not all things are equal. She says there's so much uncertainty about the role of natural variation in the climate that she doesn't know what's going to happen. She says a catastrophe is possible but warming could also turn out not to be such a big deal. What you hear from her a lot is, we don't know. And she focuses on uncertainties and unknown unknowns far more than on the consensus of climate scientists who say we know enough to be deeply worried. I've been trying to understand how there can be such a strong consensus given these uncertainties. Her message that day on Capitol Hill was in essence that humans may be contributing to climate change, but we simply don't know how the climate will behave in the coming decades. So there may be no real point in trying to reduce emissions. That played well to Republican committee members, including David Rohrabacher, a Californian who sees climate change as a liberal plot. We've gone through warming and cooling trends, but how much of this has anything to do with human activity and gives an excuse by government to control human activity, meaning our lives and our freedom. To find out how Curry got to where she is, we met up during her summer break which she takes far from the sticky of the tubes. Well, I have to ask, just wait a minute. Too many cars. She and her dogs love Tahoe Meadows, a cool pine forest on the California-Nevada border, not far from her daughter's house in Reno. What are their names? The brown one is Bruno, and the black one is Rosie. They are friendly and curious, half Australian Shepherd, half Poo. The meadow the place for them to run, and there's also chipmunks. You hear the little cheep, cheep, cheep of chipmunks. They go crazy trying to find them. The dogs bound on ahead of us as we head up the trail. Bruno, pay attention. We crest the ridge, look down over Lake Tahoe, and settle down on a chunk of granite. Curry, who is 60 years old with gray and brown hair and steely blue eyes, is a bit of an outcast these days in the world of climate science, but it wasn't always so. She first came into the public eye in 2005. Right after Hurricane Katrina devastated New Orleans, she co-authored a study saying that hurricanes could become more powerful as a result of climate change. It generated a lot of media attention, which we were ill-prepared to deal with. We were getting attacked both from the anti-global warming crowd as well as a large number of people in the hurricane community who thought this was natural variability. And that was just her first taste of the rough and tumble climate debate. A few years later, an apparent hacker released a lot of private email conversations among the scientists involved with the UN Climate Assessment, the IPCC. Curry stepped into the middle of this and started engaging some of the skeptics. I took it upon myself to try to calm the waters a bit. I said, oh my gosh, this might really blow and this is not going to be a good thing for climate science or the IPCC. So I, I wrote an essay on the credibility of climate science, which she published in the blogosphere. Her philosophy, then and now, is that climate scientists would more readily acknowledge the uncertainties inherent in the issue, skeptics would more likely accept the well-established central tenets of global warming. To give one example, she says human activities are contributing to global warming, but she bridles at the UN IPCC consensus that humans are largely responsible. It might very well be right around 50% or even a little bit less. I mean, this is what we don't know. Curry started her own blog, which is a forum for outsiders to weigh in on climate science. She sees it as democratizing the discussion. All we can do is be as objective as we can about the evidence and help the politicians evaluate proposed solutions. Um, 
but their solution seemed to be don't do anything. I well, mean, it's yeah, that 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 may be. I don't know. I can't say myself that that isn't the best solution. And this is where Curry parts company most clearly with her peers. For example, the leading scientific organization for Earth scientists, the American Geophysical Union, says climate change requires urgent action. It concludes that there's no scenario where climate change will be inconsequential. Curry's dissent from this position is as much about the economics as the science. I have six nieces and nephews who have recently graduated from college. Not easy finding jobs, you know, in this economy. Are we going to jeopardize their economic future? And we don't even know whether they're going to care or whether this is going to matter? Of course, doing nothing to address climate change is actually doing a lot. Carbon dioxide levels are growing fast in the atmosphere and destined to double or triple over pre-industrial levels. How do you acknowledge that? I don't know how concerned I should be about it. Um, on what time scale that might happen, whether it's 100 or 200 years, what societies will be like, what other things are going on with the natural climate. I mean, I just don't know what the next 100 or 200 years hold and, and whether this will be regarded as an important issue at that time. I just don't know. But, I mean, a lot of people would say, we should not run that experiment. Well, <laughs> I think the experiment is going to happen whether people think we should run it or not. Um, we're not going to convince China and India and other developing countries not to burn fossil fuels. By now, of course, Curry has strayed far from science and deep into public policy. But like all of us, she does have a personal point of view. And hers at root is not about science, it's about individualism. I uh, walk to work. I drive a Prius. I'm a fanatic about turning lights off and keeping the air conditioning high and the heating low. So I try to personally minimize my own carbon footprint, but um, in terms of telling other people what to do, um, I don't have any big answers. But leaving climate change actions to individuals will not solve the problem. You can't affect global warming by buying a Prius or adjusting the thermostat. And there's no uncertainty about that. Richard Harris, NPR. So this is uh, actually very, um, how should I call this? There's not many scientists has different this kind of view on um, there's very big uncertainty there, so we gotta do nothing. That's what I should talk about. But there's you know somebody obviously even in the climate uh, science world have uh, uh, this kind of view out there, and then I can clearly tell you. I've never seen how she drives her Prius because she always walking here and there. So that's pretty great you know statement. She just walked a lot, not driving that much. So. So let's Mike listen to a little different view on climate change and what we got to do. Tiny Desk Concert, or the latest from the iHeart NPR campaign. Go to facebook.com forward slash this is NPR. From NPR News, this is All Things Considered. I'm Audie Cornish. And I'm Alyssa Block. Next month, a scientific committee sponsored by the United Nations will put out its latest assessment of climate change. The report is expected to underscore, yet again, that climate change is a serious problem and that human beings are largely responsible. The IPCC, as the committee is known, represents a consensus view of hundreds of scientists around the world. The group shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize with Al Gore. Yesterday, we heard from a scientist who is skeptical of this majority view. Today, we meet Kevin Trenberg. He's been part of the IPCC since its early days in the 1990s, and is an outspoken defender of the scientific consensus on climate change. Trenbert's own research has sought to explain an issue frequently raised by climate skeptics, why global air temperature hasn't increased over the past 15 years. And here's Richard Harris visited him recently at his lab in Boulder, Colorado. The National Center for Atmospheric Research isn't quite the ivory tower, or like the the towering building sits on a ridge on the edge of the Colorado Front Range with breathtaking views of the mountains in one direction and the Great Plains stretching out below. Let me show you in here first. Kevin Penbrook is the most prominent denizen of the research center, its distinguished senior scientist. You never guess he's 68 years old, either by his spry appearance or his scientific productivity. And while these days he's a staunch advocate for the scientific consensus, his first foray into climate science was a cut across the grain. There was a devastating drought in 1988, which attracted the attention of one of the most renowned climate scientists. 
Jim Hansen famously went before Congress and declared that the drought was due to global warming, essentially. And I wrote a paper along with two others that appeared in Science Magazine, which basically said that it wasn't. Instead, Trinbert said the drought had to do with what at the time was an underappreciated part of the climate system, the El Nino warming phenomenon in the Pacific Ocean. Fast forward 25 years, and Trinbert still sees changes in ocean temperature as key to understanding the ups and downs of global climate. That includes the current plateau in global temperature. Climate skeptics are quick to point out that the Earth's average temperature hasn't risen for 16 years, and to them that casts doubt on global warming. But Trenberth says the planet has been heating up during that time. It's just that the heat has been flowing into the oceans, which have a vast capacity to absorb it. Will the oceans come to our rescue, essentially? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. And the answer is maybe partly yes, but maybe partly no. The oceans can, at times, soak up a lot of heat. Some of it goes into the deep oceans, where it can stay for centuries. But heat absorbed closer to the surface can easily flow back into the air. That happened in 1998, which made it one of the hottest years on record. Trenbert says since then, the ocean has mostly been back in one of its soaking up phases. They probably can't go on for much longer than, you know, maybe 20 years. And what happens at the end of these kind of hiatus periods is that suddenly there's a big jump to a whole new level, and you never go back down to that uh, previous level again. So you can think of it like a staircase. Temperature is flat when a natural cool spell cancels out the gradual temperature increase caused by human activity. But when there's a natural warm spell on top of the long-term warming trend, watch out. When the natural variability or when the weather is going in the same direction as global warming, suddenly we're breaking records. We're going outside of the bounds of previous experience. And that is when the real damage occurs. Consider Hurricane Sandy. Trenberth figures the storm was maybe 5 or 10 percent more powerful as a result of global warming, and sea level is 8 inches higher than it was a century ago. Doesn't seem that dramatic, but he argues that made a huge and costly difference. I reckon that without climate change, we would not have exceeded the thresholds that caused the flooding of the subways in Manhattan and the tunnels from Manhattan to New Jersey and to Brooklyn. Now, it's taken quite a few years for Trenberth and his colleagues to piece together the role of oceans in climate variability. It involved a huge amount of data taken from ocean buoys that take the temperature of the deep sea, along with satellites that measure energy flowing into and out of the atmosphere. And a few years ago, Trenberth was lamenting to his colleagues in an email that the Earth observing system still didn't give them all the data they needed to fully explain the ups and downs of global temperatures. And I said that it was a travesty that we couldn't uh, account for essentially the global warming in some sense. This email ended up being taken from a British computer and published along with a flood of other private conversations in an episode dubbed Climate Gate. Trembor's comment was singled out by skeptics who claimed scientists like him were covering up the truth about global warming. That email was taken completely out of context and uh, misused in many respects. Trenberth readily acknowledges that there are still some gaps in understanding Earth's overall heat balance, but that doesn't undercut the basic observation that carbon dioxide and other gases from human activity are driving up the Earth's temperature in the long run. Indeed, the last decade was the warmest on record, even though temperatures didn't keep climbing during that period. Over the decades that Kevin Trenberth has been working on climate change, the role of scientists has gradually expanded. Prominent scientists like him are trying to reduce the risk of global disruption by pushing society to act. These are frustrating times. This is very much the role of the politicians who are supposed to do what's in the best interest of everybody as a whole. Uh, and I'm not sure many politicians fully understand their role in this. There's a deep current on Capitol Hill that says it's pointless even to try, because China and India seem destined to produce so much carbon dioxide curtailing U.S. emissions won't do much at all. But wading into this policy debate, Trenberg argues that the United States should and could lead the world toward a less dangerous trend. If you play the right kind of role, then other countries will follow. You could argue that's simply wishful thinking. Or you could argue that China and India would be even less likely to address climate change if the United States wasn't even going to try. 
Earth has no illusions that we can do anything to stop the climate from changing altogether. After all, nature is changing the climate all the time. But the question now is moderating the speed of that change. Some of the human-induced changes are occurring 100 times faster than they occur in nature. And this is one of the things that I think worries me more than climate change itself. It's actually the rates of change that is most worrying. Ecosystems are not prepared for this jolt, and neither, he argues, are many human endeavors built around assumptions about how hot it's going to be, how much it's going to rain on our croplands, and how high the seas will rise. Richard Harris, NPR News. Okay, this is more, I would say, majority view on climate change by climate scientists, but that's you know, true that there's big uncertainty in terms of climate prediction. That's very true. And then uh, we are very sure that uh, greenhouse gases is per CO2. That's not sure, that's true, that it's going to be warming up the atmosphere. Then we don't know exact feedback system on aerosol. And then this um, um, interview talked about uh, ocean. We will briefly uh, talk about that thing um, beginning of the next class, next Tuesday. So there's some, um, some um, un uncertainty. Then now is your role process these interviews and then do something on climate. And then uh, you got to evaluate all the politicians' idea about climate change based on the fact. So that's my job so far. And then you got to make some decision down the road. So that's it for today. And happy Thanksgiving, guys.